Welcome to Conversations in a Vintage Shop, a podcast from behind my counter between customers. Join me while I sit behind my retail counter and just have a conversation with you or with myself. While I look out the window, observe what I see, things that are happening in the store today throughout the week, and just fun little stories that I have from my time as a business owner. This is something that you find interesting, then keep listening, and I appreciate you. Well, hey there, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me back here for episode three, season two of Conversations in a Vintage Shop. And today's episode marks a very special occasion. It is my first interview, if you don't count Charles, because we're not counting Charles. I love him dearly, but this is like my first real interview, like a big girl. And again, it's hard not to sound pretentious when talking about any of this. (laughs) But on today's episode, I have had the immense privilege of knowing and getting to know today's guest, the amazing Miss Paige Victoria. Now, I recently did a talk with her in my shop called A Conversation with Paige Victoria, Single Mom, Indigenous Badass, Survivor, Model, and Mentor. And I tell you, there are just some people in life that you meet. And the amount of life experience they've had for someone who is so young. Everybody's younger than me, so they're, they're all youngins to me. <laughs> but it's amazing how some people have gone through so much in their life. The amount of perspective and wisdom that they have to share It never ceases to amaze me. And the talk she did at my shop, I had so many more questions I wanted to ask her. And I thought, well, that'd be a perfect opportunity to invite her to be my very first guest. And in North Dakota, it's it's a more diverse state than it was when I grew up here. I was born in 1989, born and raised in Fargo, North Dakota, my entire life. I'm 32. And growing up, I had the the immense honor of experiencing the real world as a child. And by that, I mean, I went to a lower income elementary school. A lot of people said it was probably the second worst elementary school in our area, which I disagree with, but opinions are opinions. But I had so many friends from so many different races, ethnicities, cultures, backgrounds. Some of my best friends were from Thailand, South Africa, Chippewa Nation, Kurdistan. And that is the real world. And a lot of my peers, once I got into junior high and high school, had never been around anybody that wasn't white. (laughs) And so I had, again, just the immense honor of getting to know so many different people from so many different backgrounds, but hearing their stories and their struggles, and even at a young age, being acutely aware, as much as a little white girl from Fargo, North Dakota can be, about the challenges that a lot of people face when they are in minorities. And hearing Paige talk last night, it just brought back all of those memories of a lot of what my friends would tell me about and talk to me about. And a lot of my friends growing up, their biggest thing was listen. Listen to what we're telling you. Because our stories are a lot of stories. And it was a, the best and biggest lesson I could get as a child. And so I wanted to bring Paige on. Because not only does she talk about her life as an indigenous woman... In North Dakota, she talks about a lot of the struggles that she went through. And again, being a single mom, a survivor of assault, 
going into an industry, the modeling in- industry, which has historically not been kind or fair to minority women and minority genders in general. And I thought a lot of the lessons and a lot of the things she had said at her talk really resonated. And I feel like you don't have to be in modeling to fully grasp and understand what she's saying. And there was a lot of really good life lessons and things that just even stick in my head. And that I just kept thinking about all night and I was just writing questions, rapid fire. And one of them, and I'm going to ask her about this, but one of the things she said that really stuck with me, and I know a lot of you out there listening will really resonate with this, was when we're hard on ourselves. And we say we're humbling ourselves, knocking ourselves down a notch to remember who we are, where we came from. For example, yes, I did this wonderful, amazing thing. But, you know, it didn't really, it didn't cure cancer or anything. So just step back a bit. It's, don't get too excited about it. And how she was talking to me about, you think you're humbling yourself, but really you're being that toxic person in your life. You're holding yourself back with your own toxicity. But it was just, you know, little nuggets like that. That you don't have to go on a tangent. Just Anybody who can really hit you in the heart with a sentence is someone that you really need to listen and pay attention to. So it's, again, my immense honor and privilege to have Paige Victoria on today's show with me. And I'm really excited for you guys to listen to her as well. And this will not be the last time you see or hear her. She's going to be doing big things. And I, for one, am so excited to see what the future has in store for her. So without any further ado, stay tuned and listen to my friend, an amazing human being, Paige Victoria. All right. I'm so excited to have my very first interview be here with the amazing Paige Victoria. Hi, Paige. Yay, hi. <laughs> so I have to let everybody know ahead of time. We have had quite an adventure today <laughs> before oh. we even started recording. We had an amazing conversation that, I mean, of course I wasn't recording, but it was such a good conversation. It really was. <laughs> about everything, just everything. And then we took a little bit of a bathroom break so I could fill up my tea kettle go to the bathroom, everything. And we ended up locking ourselves out of my shop. We sure did that. (laughs) Locked out. Yes. And here, wandering around, trying to find someone to open the door up. I have my tea kettle. She was walking around (laughs) with her tea kettle around the whole building. (laughs) And of course, nobody was in the office. Nope, there was no one there. So that was an adventure. But here we are. We got it. We We got it. We had to stake out in front of the office for a little while. But I know. And then my building manager walks up and I think she was like, oh, God, now what? Because any time I go down there, it's something happened. Right. But this was easy. I think this was an easy fix. This was an easy fix. Well, because she had the key, thankfully. Oh, she almost couldn't find it. Yeah, I know. Right? Oh. That would have been a whole nother. would have had to call a locksmith. Right? But we're here. And I'm so excited. Let it happen. And then it's like I tinker around with like these sound recording programs. It's a whole thing. It is. But I'm excited. Me too. I am. And I was telling everybody earlier that you had just done a conversation at my shop. Yeah, we just had um, a conversation with Paige at Carmine and Hayward. That Mm -hmm. was so cool. It was amazing. I've never done anything. I've done a lot of things within my career, but I've never got to do anything like that. Like no one has been like, here's my platform or here's my space and Mm -hmm. please share your story because I want to hear it. Like I've never had that experience before. And you were natural. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I think all the years of like being in front of like a camera and walking on a fashion on a runway show, you know, Mm -hmm. um, 
do have to have a lot of confidence for that. So I always feel like I felt really ner- nervous, but yeah. not like scared nervous. Yeah. Like just like the normal, like this is exciting. Something new is going to happen. And I felt very like everyone who showed up, I felt very safe. Mm-hmm. So it was um, it was a safe place to be able to do that. So thank you for giving that to me. Thank you. Yeah. And I thought this would be a really good opportunity to have you on here because I had so many more questions I wanted to ask you. And I feel like this is the perfect place to elaborate on that Absolutely. and kind of get deeper into things than we were able to on Thursday night. Yes. So why don't you just give like a need to know info about yourself, like anybody who's just meeting you for the first time, like that kind of introduction. Okay. Well, um, I am Paige Victoria. Mm-hmm. Uh, I professionally, I have been modeling for about over four years now. Mm -hmm. I am a freelance and independent. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been doing that for a year now and it has been quite an incredible experience. It's been really awesome. Um, And I am an indigenous female. I am enrolled into the Turtle Mountain Band in Belcourt, North Dakota. But I grew up in like the Devil's Lake area. So I spent a lot of my childhood also on the Spirit Lake Nation, um, which is Fort Houghton, North Dakota. And um, my immediate family all grew up there, Mm -hmm. aunts and uncles, um, first cousins. So that's home too, very Mm -hmm. much so. I have a lot of love. Um, uh, My culture is very, very important to me. So that's why I always got to make sure to throw that in there too when I'm introducing (laughs) myself. It's very important. So um, yeah, I am a single mother as well. I have have a daughter. Her name is Isabel. Mm -hmm. Just one. Uh, I think I'm going to be a one and done. I don't know for sure. The universe, you know, (laughs) the universe will allow what it will. But I I think maybe just one. (laughs) But um. Yeah, that's a a little bit about me in a nutshell, I guess. And I thought it was really fascinating because I feel like you've lived so many lives. Like you've experienced so many things in your life that a lot of people won't ever experience, like good or bad. Yeah. And I thought it was really fascinating because we were also just talking about how we're the same age Mm -hmm. and how I don't you. And this was like that interesting thing. And I've had this conversation with people before where you think someone's younger, not because they act younger, but any of us who are of a certain age, we feel old. Yeah, <laughs> and, I know that's right. And that's the thing. And, and you fit so much into your life, mm-hmm. too. But you still have this really wise outlook. Because, I mean, the rest of us would be jaded as hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, I've gotten that. Um, I mean, I've passed as younger for, like, majority of my life that's on good genetics thanks mm-hmm. mom and dad you yeah. know <laughs> a lot of that is on that so um yeah I'm 32 I didn't start modeling until I was like 30 or uh, 24 25 like professionally sure and um I gotta go back and look at like the exact date that I really I was in a, an agency for about two three years Mm -hmm. and um i just can't remember the date exactly of when it was (laughs) but um i was around 25 um when i first started Mm -hmm. and apparently and i know this um within beauty the beauty world or the fashion world that's a little too old to be a model Mm -hmm. and and that honestly that standard is something that I even wanted to change because it grosses me out that um, these designers are supposedly making clothes for Mm -hmm. women like their clientele is women a grown woman but they want a 16 17 18 year old to model all of their stuff exactly (laughs) that never sat well with me it's actually kind of quite gross that that's that they want to they want a child Mm -hmm. to represent Mm -hmm. grown women clothes like, what are you actually trying to sell? Like, what right? are you actually selling? So that never, ever, ever sat well with me. And I was told in my, like, audition, my open call for the agency, like, well, you're a little too old to be fashion. Like, what am I even going to do with you? Like, what do you think that you're going to do? Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I'm going to do a lot. Yeah. I promise you. It was like, um, I just need to get in here and give me a shot and mm-hmm. I will, I'll do everything that I'm told that I'm I'm not allowed to do. Yeah. I'll do everything. So just watch. And um I think my the conversation went a little bit different, but I think it was like convincing enough to where they were 
they seen a passionate person mm-hmm. they were like you know what i kind of believe her you know yeah. she she might be able to do something so i got a shot and mm-hmm. um even as an older model i still made a lot of things happen for yes. myself so well that was one of the number one questions because i had asked on instagram if anybody had any questions for you and that was the number one thing is there a lot of women who reached out in this area who want wanted to know how did you get into this how how do you even get started and predominantly the women that were asking they're they're not 16 17 18 mm-hmm. but they feel like is there a place for them yes and that was the biggest question is where do you start but also with uh, a lot of the standards that have been set mm, beauty how, standards yeah how do you navigate that <laughs> um well when i first started um i was told that you needed to meet that yeah um that there wasn't no way around it um that you have to meet the beauty standards you have to be that size you mm-hmm. have to look that way you have to eat breathe, breathe and sleep model and um when I got the experience and I started um, doing all these things, um, and with e- even within the agency, I started to figure out that I don't actually have to do all that. Mm-hmm. I actually don't have to do all that. Mm-hmm. Um, we as in individuals have a lot of value just from like things that happen in our mm-hmm. life or who we are, how we are, how our abilities to do certain things and not do certain things like we are very valuable. And um, that's what we tend to forget. I think when you get signed, like when you go under these big agencies or, a- or anyone who like. If you're representing someone else and not representing yep. yourself or if you're working under some somewhere like um we get to thinking that who we are isn't enough for these things Mm -hmm. when that's actually extremely false. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe you maybe because of like my age and some of my beauty standards doesn't fit with some of what the Western world says is like beauty standards, but it fits somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I kept going um, and I was told I was too old. Um, I was too tall for certain things. I was too something for something and too something for something. But um, anytime I was told I was too much or not enough, I decided to keep pursuing mm-hmm. because I believe like I believe we can change these standards because yeah. they get changed all the time. Mm-hmm. They really do. Like, look at like beauty standards change all the time yep. before. Like when I was younger, it looked different than what it looks mm-hmm. like now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like beauty standards now is extremely fake is is all like doctor included. And mm-hmm. if that's how what women want to do to to feel beautiful, I am not saying that there's anything wrong with any of that. Mm-hmm. But that's the new standard now. Mm-hmm. It used to be I used to be the standard at one point, mm-hmm. like stick skinny like the Kate Moss era yeah 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 yeah. like I was considered somewhat beauty set now it looks different yeah um and it also depends on like modeling is actually very vast people think that it's like just one little corner just fashion just Mm -hmm. but it's actually extremely vast and everyone really does have a home in modeling Mm -hmm. because there's designers that go outside of the beauty standards there's designers that only work with big women Mm -hmm. there's um now a lot of indigenous um stylists Mm -hmm. they won't work outside of um not to say that they're like oh nobody outside of native because there's been plenty of other um models but it's more so for exactly you know what i mean you Mm -hmm. just gotta find there's nothing wrong with that you just gotta find like your avenue within it and um i didn't know how vast modeling was there's um sports modeling beauty modeling commercial fashion editorial high fashion like you can do local stuff which looks completely different mm-hmm. than um other other fashion you know so um i truly believe that if you believe you can do something if you believe you can do something with the modeling you absolutely can yeah. because that's how i that's how i do it because i believe that i could i'm mm-hmm. like i can i can change this i can change the beauty standard i can mm-hmm. change this age, age limit thing because i'm gonna be so good mm-hmm. that that number is not gonna matter and i was able to show up and do that in yeah. some spaces you know as like the 
older model. And it sucks because it was that was a little hard on your self-esteem when you're a 25-year-old woman getting told you're too old for something. <sighs> that was hard to like get through. When I went on my own, I had to uncondition from a lot of those things. Um from being told that you're not enough mm -hmm. or you're too much or yep. you're this or you're that because you get told that a lot when you're in this industry you're not enough or you're too much and um i felt like i really had to decondition the way a lot of my thought process was just from being under mm -hmm. just from being signed under somebody and um, my mental health was already like kind of lacking just because of regular life yeah. you know what i mean i'm a single mom and mm -hmm. i had a lot of things go a lot of things i needed to heal so um it was really difficult but man i did it yeah i really didn't like i'd be in the middle of it and i'm like how am i doing this how am i doing this and it was just the willingness to just do it mm -hmm. see what happens have complete faith in everything i'm doing yeah even if like i'm not even 100 percent sure it's a good idea i just have to have faith that what i just always had faith that whatever i'm doing i'm going in with a good heart so something's going to come out of it mm -hmm. it might not look like how i want it to look like but something yep. will and that's kind of how i walked into these settings is i just didn't allow people to put push their beauty standards on me and tell me i needed to be mm -hmm. um because anytime I would start to feel that, man, that was really, it was really hard and it was very hurtful. Mm -hmm. And the only person who can like, you choose what you're going to be affected by and what you're mm -hmm. not going to be affected by. I started to, I start, I was like, when I really started, my, when I really started being bothered by some of these things, I was like, only I can fix this. Yep. I have to take myself out of the situation mm -hmm. and um, do what I think is going to be best for me. And I've always kind of I've always kind of done it that way. Mm -hmm. And um it's it's helped me out a lot. Well, and that reminds me of two specific things you had talked about that I feel like just in general are really important. They stuck out to me and they I've been thinking about them a lot mm -hmm. since you had said them. And the first was going back to when you were in an agency. Mm -hmm. And you would, I mean, we're in North Dakota. Yep. We are, we're not New York. We're not LA. Like we don't have diversity. No. Like other places have diversity. And I remember you saying that you would walk into a room and have to make others feel comfortable around yep. you. You would have to make them feel comfortable. And that really hit me that you had, like you were one person yep. having to make this group of I'm assuming predominantly white women. They were all white. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And you had to make them feel comfortable, comfortable with my presence. I felt like I had to do that. Otherwise, I would have had a very terrible shoot. Like I would have, I would have, they would have made me feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. the whole time because they don't want to, they don't want, they didn't want to interact with me. They were already mm -hmm. all grouped up together in a little corner. And I walk in the room and I, whenever I walk in anywhere, I'm, I smile. Yep. Um, that's just who yeah. I am or how I am. And I walk in all smiles and I get the heads turn right away mm -hmm. to look away from me and not make eye contact with me and like kind of like ignore her, ignore her, ignore her. And I'm not, I'm, I am grown woman. I know when these things are yes. happening to me. <laughs> I'm very intuitive. I know when these things, I know when these things are happening to me. So, um, it wasn't the first time that that happened, but it was like, I walked in. They were all grouped up. They did the whole don't look at her thing, try to like whatever. And I went off to my own little corner. And any time uh, there was one other minority that was there, she was a black woman. And um, she walked in. They did the exact same thing to her. And, of course, she came over to me because I didn't do that to her. Right. So just naturally we got segregated we walked in the mm -hmm. door and they didn't make us welcome so i was like you know what this this shoot is gonna be so uncomfortable this entire time until i do something about it so i would have to walk up to this group of people mm -hmm. and introduce myself and now granted i didn't have to do that but i didn't want animosity or bad energy yeah. Because I wanted to do well during this shoot. Mm -hmm. And I knew since I was outnumbered, I'd probably get the blame for it if I decided. Like as minority, if, 
if you get hostile because of somebody else's bad mm-hmm. attitude, you're the problem yeah. because you got hostile about it. Mm-hmm. Even though it hurt your feelings and it was not right, mm-hmm. you're the angry native lady now. You're yeah. the angry indigenous woman who mm-hmm. won't be, you know what I mean? And it, it sucks that like, that that's what happens when we try to stick up for ourselves. Yeah. So in that instance, I decided to just like make it comfortable because it wasn't it wasn't that heavy. It was it was messed up, but it wasn't that heavy. So mm-hmm. I was like, let me just go up and say hi. But after look back looking in, it actually kind of frustrates me that it frustrates me that I even had to do that. Oh, that exactly. I, that I had to do that like numerous times. There was other times where it was like the exact same situation. And um, this one particular girl, she was a white girl, too. She walked into the room and she recognized me for something. She was friendly. She was outgoing. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she came up to me and started talking and all of these things, then all of a sudden the group of the other girls that were over here in the corner are slowly flocking over to us and then wanting to have a conversation with me and even telling me that they knew who I was. Oh, we've heard about you. We've seen you in this and you did amazing things. And I was like, well, where was this energy? Exactly. Like five minutes ago, like I don't I, I, I'm not I know why I guess I kind of know why that it's like that. It's just because we're not diverse here. No. <laughs> and usually, usually, especially like this younger generation, they hear things that like their parents had to say about something. Mm-hmm. It's not even their own experience with minorities. Mm-hmm. It's like their parents experience minorities yeah. or their friends experience minorities or whatever. It's not even like they don't even have any experience so it's just like they're afraid of the unknown or like you know like just stereotypical labeling Mm -hmm. because they just don't know any better and they know better but they just don't they just choose not to know um or choose to make it better i should Mm -hmm. say but i think a lot of that is it's north dakota i'm sorry but north dakota is a very racist state especially for the original occupants which is native americans it's just like i'm not Mm -hmm. boohoo crying this is just all facts exactly this is just what it is so um i knew that that was i i kind of prepared myself Mm -hmm. um and i'm not really i just prepared myself by like knowing that this is probably going to happen to you as an indigenous woman so i just decided to keep killing them with kindness but after a while that started to wear on me because i'm like i don't deserve to be treated this way Mm -hmm. just because i am different like i'm very kind and nice to everyone um i do good everywhere Mm -hmm. i i I live my life to be good and treat others good around me so i know that i don't deserve that kind Mm -hmm. of treatment be different if i was out here acting however but i just i just don't do that so it became to a point to where i was like well i didn't feel like my representation really was matching me Mm -hmm. and how i wanted to go about it nor did i think they really even cared about the the struggles that i went through as like an indigenous Mm -hmm. person maybe they tried but um who knows i just felt like I don't want to be in these spaces anymore. I'm going to create my own spaces and get around people because I was getting put in these spaces that they had to offer, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, they didn't match me at Mm -hmm. all. Um, I wasn't getting treated good in these spaces. And um, for a minute there, it kind of almost felt like I was like the token. Yeah. And that shit was not okay with me. I said that was never no one's going to do that to me. You know what I mean? So I granted, I don't know for sure if that's what it was, but that's how it started to feel. And when I started feeling all of these things, instead of like making accusations or talking bad or doing other thing, I was just like, you just have to do what you said you were going to do for yourself. Mm-hmm. You just have to do you don't, you know how to now. Yep. So I decided it's time. Um, and I stepped out and since I stepped out and I've been, um, freelancing and doing my own thing, every space that I've been in has been beautiful and loving and they want me there. They're asking me to come. Mm -hmm. They're asking me to be there. And I just believe that the universe will absolutely give you everything that you want and you Mm -hmm. need. Um, as long as you're living in a good way. Yeah. If you're being good, it's not to say like nothing bad's going to happen to mm-hmm. you. It's going to mm-hmm. happen because that's life, but you'll get through it. And the universe got your back through it. There's something that you're going to get from it in the long mm-hmm. run. And I truly believe that. So I feel like I kind of paid my dues while I was siding under somebody and um, took 
took the crap that I had to take and um, it was all to be able to be where I am yeah. now, to be able to hold myself the way that I do, to have the conversations that I can and the know-how because I know. Yeah, you've seen it. You've I know, it. <laughs> exactly. Like I know all of it now so I can speak on it. And um, it was really tough being, I mean, I think just being native in North Dakota is kind of mm-hmm. can be tough sometimes just alone, but working along side by side with the, um, you know, the Midwestern, whatever that looks like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. groups of people. It just, um, I felt more love when I went to New York. Mm-hmm. Anytime I worked locally, it was not a, it was not very comfortable. I should say. And I know why. <laughs> well, and, and it is interesting. It's it's almost like North Dakota in this area is its own little bubble. Yeah. And like in the uh, dark almost still yeah. with how everyone else treats everybody exactly. else. You know what I mean? A little bit. So um, it, it is hard. It I was grateful whenever I could go work out of town and mm-hmm. um, because... They have a lot more respect, especially for indigenous people. All the people that I've worked with outside of North Dakota, um, the minute I'm telling them that I'm an indigenous, indigenous, it's almost like this weird, this weird shift of respect would almost, it would be more. Yeah. After, after we figured it out. And um, I'm like, weird in these areas where there's not that many native americans they're so much more nicer to us and why do you like why do you feel that is it's because they had because when you're in an area where you have to deal with another minority or another when you're in an area where you have to deal with each other more um there's more there's more stories there's more things that happen so like they're closer to reservations and reservations are rough areas Mm -hmm. you know that maybe they had one bad experience um in that area or with someone from that area and then um it just goes on and on and on oh it's like north dakota is a small state Mm -hmm. a lot of people know a lot of people so uh my my uncle had an issue with a native blah 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 blah. so i don't like natives my dad said xyz a native did this i don't like natives. it's literally just that i think i think but i it's deeply rooted from the amount of like genocide that happened in this area yeah. and the amount of like the the land to like we're right next to south dakota and that's still an issue where all that stuff happened in north dakota like the, all the settlements and all the stuff and everything that happened here it goes back goes back very 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 far when it comes to why people in north dakota are so whatever towards native americans i believe anyways yeah. it goes way back far far back um and i'm i'm starting to i'm starting to see it more now hey everyone this is editing courtney here and i wanted to pop in before this next segment and give everybody a trigger warning we will be discussing sexual assault and abuse and i know for some of you listening this is a very traumatic issue and i wanted to give you a chance to pause and just give you a heads up It's important to listen to Paige's story because this is something that a lot of Indigenous women have and continue to face. So if you can listen, it's extremely important. But I do understand that if it's too traumatic for some of you, then this is your opportunity to skip ahead or tune out. All right, now we're back to it. Well, and it's interesting, and I'm going to circle back to modeling because, again, like, I really want people to hear the the path you've created for yourself. Okay. And what I find really fascinating is how you even you talked about. I mean, growing up was really hard, mm. and all the trauma that you had experienced. But then you add on to it that you're an indigenous woman. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's something that nobody can relate to, yep. like compounded and compounded. So what was that? Like, how did that shape you growing up? It made me tough mm-hmm. um, when I was a child. So um, I had to have been like starting from the ages like four up to like 
I'm gonna say around seven or eight I was um sexually abused raped and molested by my um older stepbrother and um it was like it started like when I was really really tiny 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 and um I tried to reach out I tried to write a letter to my mom about when Mm -hmm. it happened and um she ignored it I didn't know until I was 18 that she actually got the letter but she did. But I wrote her a letter and nothing happened for it. And he even continued to babysit me. So my mom was an alcoholic. Um, she's also, I found out now as an adult that she is also a survivor. She she got raped or molested within her family when she was younger. So when it happened to me, she had no idea what to do about it because nobody did anything about it to her. Yeah. And I realize that now. But I didn't know that as a child. I thought just no one loved me. Mm-hmm. Um I didn't actually tell like anyone else about it until I had to start going to counseling in fourth grade because I was a very angry little girl. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I was fighting um, all the time. I was very rude and mean to my teachers. I was hitting my teachers. Mm -hmm. I was not very nice to my classmates. And they're just like, what is wrong with this little girl? And then finally in fourth grade, when I, uh, after a lot, a lot of counseling, I finally told my counselor, what my therapist what happened Mm -hmm. and um that's when she made me tell my family about it and um here's the interesting thing and I didn't even tell you this yet but um I'm from a mixed family so um part of my family is white and then Mm -hmm. part of my family is native and out of my siblings um I out of my only one blood sister we were lived under the same household she has blonde hair and blue eyes she looks nothing Mm -hmm. like me and i look the way i look right Mm -hmm. so we lived under the same house same household but lived two completely different lives solely because we don't look the same Mm -hmm. she didn't the things that happened to me didn't happen to her Mm -hmm. um so when I finally told like my family and stuff about it, um, my sisters told me that they didn't believe me because it didn't oh. happen to them. Yeah, and my dad, um, I think it hurt him a lot to know that something like that happened to his daughter. So he like kind of shut it out. Mm-hmm. So even though I told people about it, I was left to deal with it still by myself. They're like, "Go to counseling. Don't ever talk about this ever again." It was like a very closed off subject. Um, so I went through my life trying to deal with that. I had a lot of animosity towards my family mm-hmm. for many years, many, many, many years, um, because I didn't understand like, oh, why didn't you guys love me? But I understand it had nothing to do with them not loving me. Now I understand it had everything to do with them. Um, being scared Mm -hmm. and not knowing what to do because that's a pretty I know I would do handle that a lot different (laughs) you know but um they handle it went the way it went um it it made me pretty tough um having to go through that alone um the whole grieving process and everything alone um I didn't get along with my family a lot of times. I started drinking a lot, um, Mm -hmm. a lot. And um, I am an alcoholic who has been sober now for two years. And that is very important to my story because my life started changing around when I really decided to get, when I started admitting that alcohol wasn't an issue Mm -hmm. for me um, because I was traumatized, childhood trauma, generational trauma. And then I added um, my alcoholism and alcohol on top of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a very extremely, high functioning alcoholic Mm -hmm. so um i was still a decent person Mm -hmm. um i still worked and i took great care of my daughter and i was still a good friend um but it was just like instances where i could get drunk once and like ruin a whole friendship you know what i mean and that was just not sitting well with me so um part of that is ending generational trauma deciding to quit drinking um alcoholics both parents were alcoholics mom was a drug user and um if we don't stop that if we just continue that cycle it's just a continued cycle Mm -hmm. when I started when I got older and I started to really realize like what trauma is like and how it actually affects you and how it can affect your child it's like I have to change this so a big motivation to change that was to um was my daughter Mm -hmm. so she so that lifestyle that was so normalized to me is not normalized to her Mm -hmm. so that was part of it so all of these like tragic things that happened when I was younger really made me extremely tough. Yeah. Um, I was able to 
to make it to where I wasn't angry anymore. And I could, cause I was angry tough for a mm-hmm. long time, very angry tough. And I felt like I had to be, especially in this area, being an indigenous woman, if I wasn't tough and I didn't stick up for myself, then I was pushed around. Yeah, I was told that I was less than I was told this, um, picked on, bullied, mm-hmm. all this stuff. If I didn't decide, if I, I felt like if I didn't stay tough and stick up for myself, mm-hmm. I was going to get messed up. I was going to get even more messed up. And I said, no more, no more, no more. I started sticking up for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically, when I had to be there for myself, I started sticking up for myself, too. I was like, all right, no one's going to do this for me. Absolutely no one's going to do this for me. It has to be me. It has to be me. So it started being me and I started sticking up for Mm -hmm. myself. So it it, it, all of that stuff. Because it can look different for everyone's story is different. When it, some people, when they go through that stuff, they shut down and they can't do anything. They're extremely introverts and and can't barely mm-hmm. ha- hold a conversation or go out in exactly. public. And it's like that at times for me. But I know that that's not me. So I mm-hmm. fight against it. I know that it's an anxiety and depression. That's I don't give it anything. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't use it as an excuse either because it's easy to do that. Well, I couldn't do X, Y, Z today because I was really depressed. I could barely leave my bed, which is true. Mm-hmm. And I've done that, but I'm aware. So I have to fight that, you know, mm-hmm. it, it made me tough. Like, I hate to say it, like going through all of that stuff made me actually a very tough woman. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was my choice to become that tough woman. You have two choices when you go through this whole process and you learn trauma and you start coming admitting like i'm not okay i'm traumatized i'm going through all this so it can look like two different ways some people and i this did happen at first we soak in it Mm -hmm. you know we were we're like we start using it as a crutch unknowingly unknowingly we start doing that and um we have to choose to be stronger than our diseases. Mm-hmm. We have to choose to fight against our, and and that's the most frustrating thing. And I've gotten so frustrated with the thought that it's like, I didn't ask to be an alcoholic, but every single day I have to fight the urge to not drink because one drink could ruin my entire life. Mm-hmm. It really is that serious. And um, it's like that for drug addicts or yep. people addicted to anything. Yep. Like we have to check our behavior when we have like mental health issues. Mm-hmm. We have to check our behavior 24 7 and hold ourselves accountable but i'm telling you by doing that it like it helps your life Mm -hmm. when you hold yourself accountable for these things and these things that are doing and it stops being you can you you to me i got a little bit more power over it Mm -hmm. when i was like i think i can control this a little bit better i can control how it makes me act because i'm not gonna sit here and act like it's sunshine and rainbows and i'm like bulletproof and all that stuff because there's times to where i need to take a week and mope like it's okay to do those things but Mm -hmm. not being stuck not being stuck there and to keep going it and um feeling those things are 100 percent necessary but it's risky Mm -hmm. when you are very depressed and ang- anxious person yeah. and mental health and all that stuff but it's ne- it's necessary those mm-hmm. mental breaks you know and stuff are necessary and um so <clears throat> it really all of the trauma and all this stuff i have to look at it as i have to look at the positives of where i am mm-hmm. from it otherwise i couldn't have w- went forward there yeah. is positives behind I hate to say it. It just sounds so terrible. But there is b- positives behind all of that. Not until later in life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was always my choice to change it. To change the narrative. Mm-hmm. To turn it into something pow- empowering instead of something. I could have gave in to my addiction to alcohol. And I would look completely different right now. My life mm-hmm. would look completely different right now. Um, will willpower willpower is kind of what it all comes down to on how i made any of this happen it Mm -hmm. all comes down to willpower and we all have it we all have the willpower to do anything like it takes willpower just to get out of bed Mm -hmm. and it means a lot to a lot of people because getting out of bed is hard it really is when you're dealing with mental health issues just wait opening your eyes is like ugh. And then I have to take a step out of this bed. Ugh. Like it's very, very hard. But we all have the willpower because we are all very strong. 
to be able to get over it. We just have to recognize it. And it mm-hmm. took a lot. It took a lot for me to even recognize that I can, can control these things. I mm-hmm. actually can. Um, it It's not easy all the time, but it is we really do have a lot more power than we like to even mm-hmm. as mental health and, and addicts mm-hmm. and like all this, all these issues, like we have so much power and yep. we just have to remember, I forget all the time. And then the universe will have a way of checking me or humbling me and be like, you had control of that the whole time. Mm-hmm. You're being a big baby right now. <laughs> you know, a lot of self awareness yes. came with it. And that was the biggest blessing mm-hmm. Of them all, and you have to like when you're going through that self awareness. You, I, I kept holding myself so accountable to the point to where I started treating myself like crap. Because mm-hmm. I'm like, you have you have to hold yourself accountable, Paige, for this. You have to do. You did this. You did that. You did that. And then it mm-hmm. came down to me like really punching down on myself yeah. about about things that I needed to forgive myself about. Yeah, you know what I mean. So. <clears throat> I don't even know how I did it. It just all happened. I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of faith in um, myself Mm -hmm. and in my spiritual ways. I have a lot of faith in why I'm even here. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that for a long time, but I, I, I believe we all have a purpose and I'm kind of starting to see that purpose a little bit more. And I don't believe we are put through anything. We all have heard that, that saying like, like God won't give you anything too much that you can't handle. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I believe that. And I also believe that um, he wouldn't put us through anything unless it was absolutely crucial. Even if it's horrid, there's something that can be gained and, and helped. Usually it's for somebody else, mm-hmm. I think. Because a lot of the things that I went through are helping other people when I talk about it because I'm figuring it out. You know what I mean? So it's like there's a grander scheme of of things of why we go through things. Mm -hmm. I do believe that, especially if you're trying to be a person that wants to help to, or you are a person that wants to help somebody. If you're a healer or helper in any way, you're going to go through it the most. Mm -hmm. Because how do you know to help people if you haven't actually went through it? How do you know what people need or how do you understand the mind of like the traumatized if you're not one? Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't have like a mentor or anything like that but since I figured it out kind of figured it out on my own that, that means something. Yeah. That means something for somebody, not even for me, I don't mm-hmm. think. It's it's for somebody else to help somebody else. And um my mindset got here got here just off of the way my life has played out it just played out this way and I stayed I'm, I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it and I kept going and um kept believing and everything happened the way the way it did regardless you know all right everyone that concludes part one of my interview with Paige Victoria and as you've noticed I didn't fill anything in with any music or extras or anything like that as I do my other episodes because I wanted to focus just on the interview itself and it will also be that way for the next episode. So if you want to hear part two of my interview with Paige, make sure to hop back on here next Monday. New episodes go live every Monday at 5 a.m. Central Standard Time. And I thank you. This was an amazing talk, and we still have more to talk about. And I can't wait to see you back here Monday. Thanks, you guys. Mm